On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Facebook is back in the news, and now they say they are collecting data from the portal devices. Another ransomware attack, but this time they used Hurricane Florence as a distraction. And Curtis, Brian, and I talk with Bill Clatt Kaplan, CEO of Digital Envoy, about access and identity management and how SSO and MFA can help your organization. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 313, recorded October 19th, 2018. SSO with MFA. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Wasabi's disruptive cloud storage technology is helping enterprises solve one of their fastest growing issues, data storage. See for yourself with free, unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click free trial, and use offer code ENTERPRISE. And by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy manage and scale your applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twit. And by JW Player, the most powerful and flexible video platform enabling businesses, including twit.tv, to customize the video experience on their website. To learn more and get 50% off your business subscription, visit JW Player dot com slash twit and use code twit at checkout. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big world of the enterprise but I definitely can't guide you through this big world alone. I need help from the subject matter experts in the enterprise, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, how are you, my friend? Doing well, Mr. Maresca. Doing very well. This was a busy week down here in the swamp. Uh, spent some time at the Gartner Symposium, the IT Expo, as well as at the Internet 2 Tech X. So uh, stuff coming from both ends of the geeky spectrum and uh, lots of interesting people to meet, lots of great stories to write and lots to talk about here on Twyatt. Fantastic. Now, you, you have a little bit of, uh, of, of a traveling buddy there with all those places, right? I do. You know, they don't let me go to these places by myself. So uh, <laughs> the Twyatt headquarters staff has been kind enough to send our Twyatt producer, Brian Chi, Chibert himself, here to be with me. We are doing some great stuff. He's being tremendous help as we get the full Swamp Studio kitted out. Um, and we're also managing to uh, stay unindicted. So uh, <laughs> we're going to call it a successful visit so far. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to hear all your adventures that you guys are doing. Well, of course, our next host is fitting quite well in our ent- enterprise expert panel over the last couple of weeks. Brian, Mr. Brian Henry from F5, Work, F- F5 Networks. <laughs> Brian, thanks so much for being back. Hey, thanks, Lou. So you've uh, you've been busy, busy quite well too. You're you're in the beginning of starting to travel soon, right? Yeah. So uh, things will kick off uh, in earnest next week. We'll be heading to Seattle, uh, San Jose later in the month. And then uh, looks like I might be headed to the land down under sometime in December. Fantastic. Fantastic. I get these little notes slipped to me from my son. It says, can I play Halo? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I don't know if, if the show will be as fun as playing Halo, but we definitely have a pretty good show today. We're going to be talking about how Facebook's back in the news around security media again, as well as malware and ransomware continues to strike when you least expect it. And our guest from Digital Envoy is here to talk about SSO and MFA. But this week was filled with quite a bit of news. So what, like we always do, let's go ahead and jump into the blips. Now, in the wake of Cambridge Analytica, data, the data leak scandal, Facebook has done what it can do to ensure it's revitalizing their user accounts' concerns on security and privacy. Now, also, this also includes putting out, putting on a hold in some projects and plans that might cause sensitivity to external users. Well, it's found that recently a plan by Facebook to ask, ask several major U.S. hospitals to share anonymized data about their patients, such as illness and prescription information, for a proposed research project 
was also put on hold. Now, part of the plan was to match the data up with data Facebook from Facebook collected from its users to assist hospitals to figure out which patients need special care and treatment. Now, because of the hold, the program has not gone past the planning phases, but it does bring a bit of new light to how the social giant could use your data when it's collecting your data. Uh, data sharing agreements had been made with Stanford Medical School, American College of Cardiology, and several others. Although the data being shared removes PII or personal identifiable information, Facebook could use hashing to match individuals with specific characteristics and attributes of their medical data. Exploratory efforts to share medical-related data ha- was led by an interventional cardiologist uh, called Freddie Abs- Abnausi. Uh, who describes his role on LinkedIn as a leading top secret leading top secret projects. Now, whether it's meant to improve patient care or not, we are in a whole new realm of privacy here, and it might be time to start thinking about what you are sharing openly in the world because it just might be linked up with even your private data later. So if you're developing applications, especially web applications, be on the lookout for .ht access. Vulnerabilities in Apache functions have been at the root of significant breaches, including incidents like the little thing involving struts at the heart of La Faire Equifax. Now, re- new research by Larry Cashdollar, a vulnerability researcher and member of Akamai's security incident response team, indicates that another such vulnerability may be putting thousands of applications at risk. He found an issue with the way that thousands of code projects are using Apache.ht access leaving them vulnerable to unauthorized access and a subsequent file upload attack in which auto-executing code is uploaded to an application. The problem, he said, is that .ht access functionality was turned off by default beginning in Apache version 2.3.9 for very good reasons involving performance and security misuse. The real problems occur when a developer looks at very old documentation and uses .ht access for authentication instead of one of the methods now suggested by the Apache Foundation. And let's be really clear, this change was made a good seven or eight years ago. Now, the worst part of all this is that it's going to fail silently when someone uses this and it .ht access is called because it returns no error message, and it does allow free access. For developers, the implication is clear. Review changes to the systems and libraries used in projects and make sure that all are being used and configured in ways that permit them to do the job they're called to perform in the application being built today. Microsoft makes its 60,000 patents open source to help protect Linux. The company is joining the Open Invention Network and announced last week an open source patent group designed to help protect Linux from patent lawsuits. In essence, this makes the company's library of over 60,000 patents open source and available to OIN members, according to ZDNet. OIN provides a license platform for Linux for around 2,400 companies, from individual developers to huge companies like Google and IBM. And all members get access to both OIN-owned patents and cross-licenses between their OIN licenses royalty-free. Microsoft joining is a big step forward for both sides. OIN gets thousands of new patents from Microsoft, and Microsoft is really helping the open source community that it has shunned in the past. As Scott Guthrie, Microsoft's executive vice president of the cloud and enterprise group, commented in an interview to ZDNet, we want to protect open source products projects from IP lawsuits, so we're opening our patent portfolio to the OIN. There are exceptions to what Microsoft is making available, specifically Windows desktop and desktop application codes, which makes sense for many reasons. But otherwise, Microsoft is going open source, and ultimately, that's a good thing for the whole Dell developer community. Bottom line is that this move should make it easier for open source developers to, to make their solutions more compatible with the Microsoft ecosystem with less worry of copyright infringement. Now, the topics of machine learning and artificial intelligence are deep and complex and areas that are really hard to understand. So buzzwords like deep learning and neural networks are everywhere, and it just adds to the complexity. Well, Professor Terry Sanofsky wants to help disambiguate it for the world and help people understand the global challenges that AI could solve. Now, this guy is a giant in this field. Not only is he an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, he's a computational neuroscientist at Salk Institute for Biological Studies, as well as a professor of biology at the University of San Diego. Now, 
he has quite the credentials. Now, Professor Sanofsky is a pioneer in the study of learning algorithms and is recent author of The Deep Learning Revolution. Now, he argues that the hype about killer AI or robotics making us obsolete ignores exciting possibilities happening in the fields of computer science and neural science and what can happen when artificial intelligence meets human intelligence. Now, people throw around words like artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning, and machine learning almost interchangeably. And Terry wants to help you understand the how and the why they differ. Now, Terry has a great way of explaining topics to the common person. So I suggest you go check out his articles and some of the other seminars and lectures he has given. But one particular area that Professor Sadowski is interested in is he what she thinks has actually has some legs, is the deep learning area called generative uh, adversary, adversarial networks, which is called GANs by, for short. Now, GANs are capable of developing activity or outputs without any input, which can actually help evolve self-driving cars in the near future. Now, although a ton of content from Professor Snowski is interesting, one interesting statement from him denotes that we expect things to evolve quickly, and he thinks that even self-driving cars won't be ubiquitous for more than 10 years from now. Someone better tell Elon Musk that real soon. Well, I'm going to stick with authentication authentication and open doors and talk about a trivial authentication bypass in libssh. It leaves servers wide open. There's a four-year-old bug in the secure shell implementation known as libssh that makes it trivial for just about anyone to gain unfettered administrative control of a vulnerable server. While the authentication bypass flaw represents a major security hole that should be patched immediately, it wasn't immediately clear what sites or devices were vulnerable since the widely used OpenSSH and GitHub's implementation of LibSSH were not affected. The effects of malicious exploits, assuming there were any during the four plus years the bug was active, are hard to guess. In a worst case scenario, attackers would be able to use exploits to gain complete control over vulnerable servers. The attackers could then steal, oh, let's call it everything. While this is a high severity vulnerability, it looks like it should have affected a relatively small group of servers. Still, anyone who runs a vulnerable version of libssh should patch immediately. And anyone who used the app to receive incoming connections from untrusted users should consider closely examining their servers for any sign of compromise. The author of Luminosity Link is sentenced to 30 months for rat software. A 21-year-old Kentucky man who previously admitted to creating and selling a remote access trojan or rat known as Luminosity Link has been sentenced to 30 months in federal prison. Colton Grubbs had previously pleaded guilty to conspiracy to unlawfully accessing computers in the furtherance of a criminal act, among other crimes. When Grubbs was first charged, he claimed Luminosity Link was a legitimate tool for system administrators, and he never intended to be used maliciously. He, however, reversed course in a plea agreement he signed in July 2017. In that document, he admitted for the first time that he knew customers were using the software to control computers without owner's knowledge or permission. Grubbs also admitted, admitted emphasizing a wealth of malicious features and marketing materials that promoted the software. Bottom line, the rat was knowingly developed for malicious use, and the author showed no remorse for the damage caused by this creation. Now, you remember the Facebook announcement of their portal devices, right? Well, one of its hallmark claims was that Facebook wanted you to know that the data was safe with their device. They even encrypt your data on transmission. Now, Facebook even said that no data collected through portal, even call log data or app usage, like the fact that you listen to Spotify, will be used to target users with ads on Facebook. Now, after last week, Facebook has changed their minds Portal doesn't have ads, but data about who you call and data about which apps you use on Portal can be used to target you with ads on your Facebook-owned properties. Now, a quote from Facebook is, Portal voice calling is built on the messenger infrastructure, so when you make a video call on Portal, we collect the same types of information, uses data such as length of calls and frequency of calls that can be that we collect on our other messenger-enabled devices. And we, wait, we may use this information to inform ads we show you across our platforms. Other general usage data, such as aggregated uses of apps, et cetera, may also feed into the information that we use to serve ads. Now, Rafa Camargo, the product VP in charge of Portal, has apologized for sharing inaccurate info and said that while this data can technically be used for ad targeting, he doesn't know if it will be. Now, if the guy running the program doesn't know how the data is going to be used, the question you should be asking yourself is, do you trust them with your data? Well, folks, 
That does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a pretty great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Now, you might be saying cloud storage is expensive the more you store on it and the more times you actually perform operations on it. Well, in this day and age, that's actually quite true with most cloud storage companies. Now, the cloud storage competition is to see how low they can get the storage fees and those ingress and egress fees. Now, from experience, I can tell you if you try to go to the bottom line or the cheaper tiers of cloud storage, you'll also give up on performance and reliability as well. Well, these things and more is where Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage prevails. Now, if you're doing whether small personal projects all the way up to enterprise projects, Wasabi seems to have figured it all out. Now, listen to this cost. 0.49 cents per gigabyte per month or basically 4.99 per terabyte per month. Now, listen to this game changer. Unlimited egress fees for your data. Now, no charge for those API calls so you don't have to pay to actually access your data. Now, you should go check it out what you're really paying for cloud storage right now because I can tell you right now, not having to include egress fees and API calls for those CRUD operations will actually substantially save you money on the cost of doing business. Now, you're probably thinking, well, if they're cheaper, they must be slower, or they don't have as many features as Bells or Whistles, right? Well, Wasabi was, has really developed some disruptive technology. They have ways to actually pull raw performance out of their storage devices without compromising on the performance of them. They have a revolutionary process, new process, that lays down data on disks sequentially as opposed to in blocks. Now, what happens? Well, that means Wasabi's storage is 80% cheaper and six times faster than leading industry companies out there today. Now, are you an organization worried about compliance? Well, Wasabi has that covered as well. HIPAA, FINRA, CGIS compliant as well. And they have fast and cheap storage. But, you know, fast and cheap storage isn't worth it unless it's secure. Well, Wasabi has the answer. Wasabi offers a unique feature of immutable buckets that cannot be deleted or altered, thus protecting valuable data from accidental or malicious destruction which is not available on some of the competing solutions out there today, plus 11 nines of a durability. Now, are you worried about data migration to the cloud services? Well, Wasabi also has the answer to this as well. With Wasabi Ball Transfer Plans, this thing is powered by Netgear and is designed to transfer large data sets while dramatically reducing your costs. I bet you you're ready to try out right now, right? Well, go build something fun or move some of your data right now. Experience Wasabi for yourself with free Unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click the free trial link, and enter the code ENTERPRISE. See how much more storing in the cloud can save your business. That's wasabi.com, and enter the code ENTERPRISE. We thank Wasabi for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, let's go ahead and jump into the bites. Now, we've been hearing many, about many attacks that happen during events, elections, but hackers are now waiting for events that are more confusing and add a bunch of se severity or distractions for their nefarious acts. Now, recently, the N North Carolina's Onslow Water and Sewer Authority, or ONWASA, was hit with an advanced attack in the wake of Hurricane Florence. Now, this is a critical wall a water utility in North Carolina, and during the natural disaster, they had to respond to a s sophisticated ransomware attack. Now, the attack actually targeted internal computer systems, including servers and personal machines, and actually let, left them with very little computer capability. Now, customers' data was not compromised, according to officials, but many of their other databases were fully had to be fully recreated. Now, what was the attack? Well, it started with the uh, Emotet, a, a, like a, a type of polymorphic malware, which normally is delivered to a victim via email attachment, like a, a macro embedded in a document or a PDF. But Emotet is an advanced baking Trojan that mainly works as a downloader for other Trojans. Now, it's among the most expensive and destructive forms of malware to hit the state and local governments. But it actually escalated from there. And several days later, they actually had a RIUC, which is a, a highly targeted ransomware strain. But fortunately, when that ransomware was detected, employees took systems offline to prevent its spread. Now, to fix the solution, they did have to rebuild some databases. They did have to keep some services all offline for a while. But they're on the way back and they're coming back from uh, all their downtime. All right, guys. So I want to throw it over to you because I want to talk about now, Curtis, I want to talk to you first. Um, it seems like common utilities or services in that for that matter are actually um, targeted for these things. But now they're targeting them in the complete like crisis time. Um, are we are, is this something new or have you seen this in the past? I don't think this is something completely new. We've seen attacks on them in the past, but as you say, this is new because of when it happened. 
Interestingly enough, we've been warning and a lot of officials have been warning about the possibility of a critical infrastructure cyber attack. But we tended to think of it in terms of something like an IoT-based attack that would take down switches or uh, generating capacity. This hit the back office. This hit the economic part of the utility. And it hit them at the worst possible time. I think this actually is a good indicator of what could be the model for this kind of critical infrastructure attack because the attackers, well, they feel that the utility, the critical infrastructure company, has no choice. They don't have the time to do full forensics. They don't have the time to let things be shut down while they exercise their we don't negotiate with terrorists or criminals um, philosophy. So from a a money-making standpoint, this one could be effective. From a shutting down critical infrastructure, this could be horrific. Right, right, right. Well, again, when something happens in crisis, they have to worry about other things. They're not going to be looking at their systems. So that it makes sense that obviously that hackers are going to do that. They're going to start targeting systems like that. Brian, I want to throw it over to you. What, what, um, What are the normal kind of responses to this type of malware ransomware attack for an organization? Um, the usual response, pay the ransom. Uh, a lot of times that's what the deal is. Uh, now, a large organization like this may have backups and may be less prone to pay the ransom, although in, in many cases it takes too long to restore. So the backups aren't as helpful as you might think for ransomware. Now, what's interesting to me here is that this was not an attack that was executed at the time of the crisis, Right. That was merely the payoff of a rather long game. This was a very patient attack. Uh, The malware was almost certainly uh, downloaded and inserted into this organization's infrastructure long before there was a crisis. And the the attackers simply laid in wait uh, for the opportune moment to where they could maximize their return on investment. So that shows that this attacker is, is... Although they're using, uh, you know, a lot of off-the-shelf uh, typical pieces of malware, they had a long game. They had a plan, uh, and that's that's should be somewhat troubling to those who are, uh, you know, looking at themselves right now and saying, "I don't want to uh, end up in this same kind of headline." Uh, what are you doing today to identify insider threats, compromised machines? Because the attack is almost always. Uh, Pre, you know, precursored by something else, right? So the crisis moment was actually just the payoff of a of a much longer game that was played here, I suspect. And the other thing to that that I want to throw in a comment on is that this is common, right? Uh, we see DDoS attacks often not for for the uh, purpose of taking down a site. Uh, it's usually to distract systems administrators, SOC administrators who are looking at systems saying they, they see all the noise of a DDoS attack and then perhaps they miss the, uh, the the more targeted attack that's aimed at executing a breach where there's actual data compromise and that's where the uh, attacker actually gains value, right? There's not a lot of value to taking a site offline unless you ransom them uh, for bringing their site back online. There's too many uh, DDoS scrubbing tools out there. That's not become a really effective ransom anymore. What they're usually doing is they're executing a DDoS attack uh, in order to distract you, sort of a shell game, if you will, to distract you from some other attack that might be targeted at actually compromising data, which it actually does have value on the, the black market. Right. You have a good point. I mean, a lot of a lot of times you hear about breaches, you know, hey, these hackers have gotten in somehow through some weak link in the network. They've kind of sat dormant for a while. They've maybe kind of escalated their privileges by jumping between nodes or hosts on the network. And then they kind of sit there for a while. So this way they're not detected. And then at some point, like you were saying, in the point of confusion kind of pounce. Um, and of course, most likely, um, if the IT group is as good as they are, they most likely will shut down their access at some point, but they've already potentially caused the damage. So I think this is a very interesting pattern, but it seems to be that that's just kind of how it goes uh, as we're talking about malware and ransomware. Now, essentially on a network, you know, each user is potentially the weakest point, right? I mean, that's basically your weakest link and any part of a network is your users. Um, Curtis, I want to throw it over to you. What, what are organizations doing to actually, you know, obviously users make mistakes. What are they doing to make this easier, to make sure that they are not the weakest link? 
Well, I think the easiest thing to do is just get rid of all the users. The, the networks <laughs> and applications are much more secure without any users at all. Right. Uh, barring that, uh, most organizations are doing a combination of technology and training. Uh, technology can help somewhat. You do things like you scan uh, all attachments coming in. Although, you know, this has gotten much more difficult as the attackers have gotten better with things like um, using um, the uh, scripting languages, whether for uh, office scripting uh, or Microsoft management framework scripting um, as a way to get past the scans. Uh, but the big thing to do is to actually train your users. Let them, you know, just keep hammering them with the fact that you don't go and open unexpected attachments, even if they seem to come from someone you know. Um, phishing campaigns, spear phishing campaigns are much bigger, much better, and as we've seen, all it takes really is one user to open up an infected attachment and the entire network is effectively under attack. Right. Well, unfortunately, we can't go to the user as a service model just yet. But, Brian, I <laughs> want to throw it over to you because you've, you've done a lot of work on securing networks. And um, I'm curious, what, what do organizations do to help with this model, with this issue? So, number one thing lately is to set up a, a decryption point, right? So, most of our internet traffic is now HTTPS encrypted. So you're looking for something that can uh, decrypt that traffic on the way out, check it, make sure that it is what it says it is. Another thing that I, I've seen a lot of work done around is actually looking at uh, open holes outbound, right? So these Trojans often have command and control uh, as well as drop zone uh, communications where they're trying to exfiltrate data or at least talk back to their CNC servers. So we see uh, a lot of times that traffic might be tunneled out over DNS, which is often an open hole that goes gets relayed through a trusted server and flows out through the firewall. So I, I definitely see that as another way. So if there are things that you sort of generically allow out protocols, uh, whether it's DNS or maybe it's FTP or SSH, uh, put inspection tools in place to check for anomalies. And on the point of anomalies, another emerging technology that's becoming very hot and is actually making uh, some hay and actually paying off on the big data trend from a few years ago is we have all this big data around security logs and forensics. We're logging all this data and we're not making much use of it because it's just a mountain of data that's hard to make sense of. Uh, User behavior analytics or user and entity behavior analytics, it's a terrible acronym, UBA or UEBA, uh, is a way of mining that data and detecting anomalous user behavior. So secondary to uh, Curtis's excellent recommendation of educating users to lower the uh, probability of an instance of a compromise of this sort is when a user inevitably does make a mistake despite our best efforts is to detect that anomalous behavior uh, using these type of behavioral analytics uh, that are based on you know machine learning and AI models uh, analyzing uh, lots of security and infrastructure log data. Right, right, right. I mean, the interesting thing here is they, you know, most organizations, I mean, the normal line of defense here is to take the system down and restore backups. Curtis, is this something that organizations are aware of? Like, hey, you should be backing up, your, especially your back office here. I mean, this should be just backed up in a frequency to make sure that if something like this does happen, catastrophic failure, power, malware, whatever, you could just restore the system to the last known good uh, set of data or last known build for an application and you'll be, you should be fine. Now, I mean, it sounds like these, it sounds like even this organization didn't have this kind of set up. I mean, it shouldn't be organizations be doing this going forward. Oh, they absolutely should. And uh, a really good backup should be part of, well, not just a data backup plan, but a, di a business continuity plan. Uh, and that's going to include everything from data integrity up through uh, telephony, through where you're going to let your people sit if something happens to your office. So it's important to have a real business continuity plan in place. And I was talking this last week to an executive with one of the largest business continuity firms, and they said that they are, in fact, getting more and more inquiries from companies 
about how a data backup and data continuity plan can help them with issues like ransomware. The consciousness has been raised. What we don't seem to be getting in all cases is that connection between concern and action. That's the critical step that more organizations need to be taking. Right. Well, folks, that does it for the Bipes. Next up is my favorite part of the show, which is bringing in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twiat Riot. But first, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week Enterprise Tech, and that is DigitalOcean. Now, as a developer, I can tell you the ability to experiment with your apps and your code on a truly hosted environment, it's sometimes hard because it's really hard to deploy to those hosted services so easily and to kind of get that out of the way. Well, DigitalOcean innovates and removes that impedance on cloud deployments and hosting, and they make it easier for you than ever to actually deploy your applications and code and store things on cloud storage without all those steps in between. Now, I love the names that they give things over at DigitalOcean, starting with droplets, which are actually super scalable virtual machines that you can add on storage, security, monitoring capabilities with just a single click of a button. Now, they also have a really great one-click deployment model as well. It's easy to bootstrap your projects. You want a distribution of Linux? Well, one-click deploy Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, and more. And how about one-click deploy an application stack as well? Well, go ahead and add Docker, LAMP, MongoDB, Node.js, MySQL, and more with just that one click of a button. Now, not only is it easy to deploy things, it's actually easy to manage things as well. They actually have snapshots that are simple to use and take advantage of. And for me, that gives me that peace of mind that the last known good state is always one click away. Plus, team management and unified collaboration helps your teams manage and scale your infrastructure and your apps. Now, you need more security for your infrastructure? Well, there's also one-click firewalls for your droplet or droplet groups as well. And get this, cloud firewalls are free. Now, don't let that free tag fool you. Those firewalls are not for just some low-tier system. They're production-ready firewalls that can scale with your business. Now, to meet the demand of the market, DigitalOcean follows that great model of pay-for-play pricing. No more complexity in your billing or your future invoices. Now, you want more storage? Just go ahead and add more block storage that meets your application at just $0.10 cents per gigabyte per month. You have to worry about less about adding more data and more about just when you need data. Now, is your site starting to become more popular? Well, they also offer load balancers at high availability. Now, if you're like me, you like to write scripts to manage things. Well, DigitalOcean also has you covered. As an API guy, I can tell you they have pretty great APIs over there. They're just standard HTTP requests to deploy and manage thousands of droplets and resources in a simple, programmatic way. Now, there are tons of reasons why you should consider DigitalOcean. Even some of the extra stuff they don't charge you for, like enterprise class SSDs, 99.99% uptime SLA, full DNS management, and more, DigitalOcean has you covered. Now, there's no reason why you shouldn't go out right now and try out DigitalOcean, especially to support us on Twiat. Go to do.co slash twit. Even if you think about maybe making or setting up a project in the future, you should go out right now and set up an account. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twit. That's do.co slash twit for a free $100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show, and that's bringing in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have Bill Kaplan, CEO for Digital Envoy. Bill, welcome to the show. Lou, thanks for having me. Great to be here. I feel right at home given some of the things you were just talking about. So. <laughs> I figured as such. Now, before we jump in identity and access management and MFA and SSO, our audience kind of loves to hear origin stories. Can you give them a quick journey through your experiences up until Digital Envoy? Uh, absolutely. I, I'm a West Coast guy originally. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia now, but originally a Seattle guy and I uh, got my business degree from University of Washington. And my first job out of school was with uh, Burroughs Corporation back when IBM and Burroughs were the, the big names in computing. So um, I got uh, enthused walking around computer rooms with big mainframes and flashing lights and, and that love of technology and the power of it just kind of stuck with me. So um, after I left Burroughs, I, I did a very uh, various things in smaller and larger companies. Citibank and Equifax were home for a while and uh, e either was attracted to positions based on the technology that was uh, being used or that could be used. And, and if there wasn't something being used, I, I like to find ways to add to it. In fact, at Equifax, I led a uh, team that 
started the introduction of uh, the web use by uh, Equifax back at a time when that was uh, even scarier. Well, maybe not any more scarier than it is now, but but certainly scary. So um, continued on that path when I left Equifax, my uh, technology interests kind of leaned towards the uh, the Internet side and uh, uh, did some things in e-learning with some startups and uh, also with a uh, software as a service uh, for uh, medical and dental practices. Uh, also back in the early days of, uh, of SaaS deployment uh, and, uh, and even a, a stint with trying to uh, get an electronic medical records uh, business off the ground. So um, those stops led me to Digital Envoy almost 15 years ago and uh, fell in love with the company for its products, its technology and its people. And the fact that even though we've been around for 19 years now, uh, we still operate like a startup. We've got that enthusiasm for our customers, for innovation, for improving things. Uh, we still like to have lots of fun and uh, do a lot, a lot of good things, as is uh, evidenced in our digital resolve business, where uh, the good things we try to do is help people to help businesses to fight off some of the threats that you guys were talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do it very efficiently with uh, proven products and so my journey kind of ironically led from uh, mainframe days when I don't know if anybody even ever thought of stealing things at that time, stealing information, but you wouldn't need, you'd need a lot of friends and a big pickup truck to get much. Now in the internet, th there's a new threat around the corner. And uh, so Digital Resolve is, uh, is exciting to be a part of uh, in terms of trying to help to, to stop those threats and uh, at the very least mitigate them for our customers. So. Right. Now, you bring up an interesting topic. Obviously, the, the cost of data breaches are on the rise. Now, I think right now, I looked at the IBM site. Uh, it says right now it's starting this year is 3.9 million so far this year in losses due to data breaches. What are what are some of the major players here um, and the cause of data breaches uh, in some of these organizations that you see? I, I think the, the biggest, well, I mean, there are two factors. One, we read about all sorts of breaches, and it's usually the big names and and uh, for obvious reasons, they attract the headlines. But um, there are tons of breaches that go unreported, either because the companies don't want to disclose it and may not have a legal requirement to. Uh, or in many cases, there's recent statistics that say that 80 percent of the breaches go undetected for a period of time. So uh, when Brian was I'm sorry, Curtis was talking about the uh, uh, North Carolina utility. Uh, I think he's absolutely right. That breach probably occurred, that compromise occurred a long time ago. And uh, the, the criminals are strategic and, and uh, timing is everything. So uh, they deploy when it's uh, convenient and when it can wreak the most havoc. And I think that was certainly one of the worst times they could have done something like that. So. Right, right, right. Now, kind of jumping on to identity and access management side of things, um, some, something that you guys are fairly familiar with. Now, auth authentication, authorization, these types of things are kind of a mystery to people. They understand that you need to have a director of users and that their, serv their services have to verify the users and integrate them in there. But what, can you explain maybe how services and or the orchestration of those services kind of work together in the case of authorization, authentication, and kind of how um, your services are helping with that? Sure. Uh, so it, at the, the crux of, uh, of the breaches that we've heard about and that we talk about, uh, one of the most common uh, uh, origins of those is credential compromise. Uh, and Curtis touched on that as well, that uh, if, if we didn't have users, we wouldn't have some of the problems we have. And uh, really smart people end up getting uh, victimized by phishing e emails and spear phishing emails. So um, the, the credential verification and, and authentication needs to be a rigorous part of everybody's security routine. And it has to be done in layers because there's not a silver bullet. There's not one thing you can do to stop it. But uh, we try to take the approach of, um, for example, with our single sign-on solution, single sign-on's been around for a long time, um, but it was introduced as a way to make it easier for users to manage uh, the huge number of passwords and user IDs we needed to access our, our systems and applications and, and do our job. So it, it served a great purpose with that but single sign-on represents the keys to the kingdom. So if somebody gets uh, single sign-on credentials compromised, the uh, criminals that obtain that can do some really horrific things, uh, not the least of which is steal information that they can sell on the black market or, or use to turn into money some other way. But they can also sit and wait and do something at a strategic time, as we talked about earlier. Um, 
or uh, any number of things that are just intended to be malicious and damaging a business's reputation, perhaps, or uh, potentially putting a business at risk because not every company can survive those things. So, so one of the reasons that it's not necessarily publicized how those verifications take place is uh, it needs to be a little bit of a secret sauce because the uh, the criminals are pretty smart, so they'll figure out what you're doing and they'll attempt to beat it. But uh, it's why we encourage the multi-layered approach. Um, and in our case, our solutions look at log in to log out, um, make sure that credentials presented are authenticated and that the behavior profile behind them, we monitor and, and analyze those, suggests that not only are they valid credentials, but they're being presented by a valid user that has the authority to access the things they're doing. and. Uh, that leads to the whole uh, permissions and hierarchy thing that uh, every company also needs to uh, be aware of. Uh, the person that is getting into an email account needs to be treated differently than the person that is a systems admin, perhaps. So, so it needs a very sophisticated approach. We use biometrics uh, more recently, so uh, nothing will stop everything, but we certainly think you have to have uh, a lot of layers, and, and, uh, and we like the packages that we put together in that regard. Right now, there are obviously there's a lot of um, types of SSO out there today. Obviously, there's the the old standard of Kerberos, which people are seem to be getting off of now. Um, what kinds of SSO um, is your is this system using, and what's kind of the advantages and disadvantages of it? Yeah, well, ours is a really good SSO, first of all. So, uh, <laughs> as I said, single sign-on has been around for a long time, and and it's not that anything was necessarily bad about it. I I think the big differentiator for us. Uh, and what we emphasize, uh, whether someone is our customer or not, is you can't just have single sign-on and expect that, um, that you're not going to get compromised. So um, we have our own proven proprietary adaptive multi-factor authentication platform that is automatically included in our single sign-on solution. Um, many vendors offer it. Some offer very basic versions of it. And most of them offer third-party solutions that they may make money off of it, but they don't necessarily have control over. So we have total control over the, the package, which means uh, not only user control and, and uh, if you have an issue, we can handle both sides of it. Uh, it also eliminates a, a third party and potential costs. So uh, at the end of the day, it's all about how effective the solution is. And, and I think that's where we really feel like we, we stand out, that the multi-factor authentication will do a great job of making sure legitimate users get in. Um, because that's important until we reach Curtis's world where we eliminate the user. Um, we have to be able to, uh, to let business happen, and it's a 24-7 environment, so we got to be ready whenever the uh, uh, legitimate users want in. But we have to do everything we can to protect those users when they fall victim to a scam, and perhaps their credentials end up in the wrong hands. And, uh, and again, that has that spiraling effect that uh, has already been talked about. So. Got it. So one one of the interesting one actually the hard thing is to kind of integrate SSO into your kind of your um, current system, your current network, is the fact that some applications, these applications have to be acceptance of this SSO um, kind of integration, integrated type thing. How does how is um, Digital Resolve helping with this? Uh, great question. It's one I probably should have mentioned in terms of our advantages. We we deploy in the Amazon cloud. Um, so uh, the deployment is very easy. We are a standards-based solution. Uh, so we basically support any SAML 2.0 application. Um, so you could rattle, I could rattle off a long list of those, but everything from Gmail and Salesforce to Jira and Slack and uh, Zendesk. Um, uh, yeah, just any uh, app that's out there, many of them, most of them are the 2.0 versions. If they're not, we can work with those as well. But, uh, but if they are SAML 2.0 compliant, then basically it's a configuration issue as opposed to an integration issue. Uh, and that means very little time and uh, reduced cost as well. And most importantly, you get the solution in place quicker so that you can uh, begin uh, reaping the benefits of, of stopping uh, bad actors. So. Right. Now, one interesting fact is a lot of organizations, they have either B2B, B2C, B2E. Now, does, does your SSO actually help with all of those as well? Can like they have customers actually use a similar technology with their network and with logging into their systems and their applications? Yeah, another great question. And, and, and the answer is absolutely yes. So uh, it, it's probably much more logical and intuitive in an employee environment where you have employees that are accessing an accounting system, an expense reporting system, an HR portal. Um, but 
forget the fact that it's a single sign-on in the hands of a customer, an external customer, uh, consumer type, um, you still have to have the same mechanism that that password is a gateway into your business and uh, making sure that that's uh, presented properly, that the credentials are valid, and that it is a valid user preventing, uh, presenting it uh, protects your business. And most importantly, it protects that consumer from being duped uh, or, or your, your business customer in, in a different case, uh, because they may have information stored. They may have credit cards stored in some cases. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Single sign-on is particularly valuable if you have uh, you know, a bazillion uh, passwords and IDs to keep track of. But even if you just have one, um, the, the use of that by somebody not authorized to use it can be detrimental to, uh, to any type of customer. Right. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in because they have some, they're chomping at the bit here in the chat room and I wanted to make sure that they had a chance to ask the questions. Curtis, I want to throw it over to you first because you wanted to ask about the whole concept of SSO and how it relates to zero trust. Yeah, you know, you talk to a lot of people who who very rightly point out that the the problem with authenticating only at the border is that once someone is in, and as you pointed out, if they're in with uh, stolen credentials, this is a huge issue. But once they're in, they're in, and they have the keys to whatever rights that particular user had. So a lot of people are looking at doing things like continuous authentication or, or zero trust, where every time you go to a new um, a new module, a new application, uh, even a new library component, there is a reauthentication. How is single sign-on working in that kind of zero trust environment? Yeah, another great question. Um, I, I'm not necessarily a subscriber to, to zero trust. I, I think that the way to do business, the way to keep employees and customers engaged is to have an element of trust, but uh, the old trust and verify. So um, multi-factor authentication doesn't have to just be at the uh, point of access. Um, and as somebody is legitimately entered and gets inside your system, whatever that system happens to be, uh, we absolutely support and encourage additional steps of verification. I mentioned a user that is simply accessing an email account. If they suddenly go from their email account to the company's uh, accounting system, and perhaps uh, they have system admin privileges, there should be an escalation in that, um, that verification authentication process uh, and, and make it tougher as they get to things that are more and more uh, likely to be uh, you know, high risk of compromise and high damage if, if it's uh, successful. So um, one of the things that we offer as a, uh, a, a secondary solution to our single sign-on and our, um, our uh, login to log out authentication is what we call behavior monitoring and analytics. I may have mentioned that. I, I'm not sure, but I, I know Brian mentioned that in talking about some of the uh, uh, the uh, the earlier discussion. So, and that is basically uh, doing exactly what you say. Because the user gets in, they presented valid credentials. It doesn't mean that they really are the valid user, or it could be an insider who is going to do something that's out of pattern, that's anomalous, that should be detected. So, our behavior monitoring basically looks for um, the inconsistencies in what that user normally does, what that user is permitted to do. Um, and things that are just indicative of somebody that's up to no good, that uh, indicates not only an anomalous behavior, but a threatening behavior. Uh, and in that case, we can provide uh, information that, that allows someone in the company to decide to block that access and basically end a session for someone. So, so I, I think steps like that, and behind the scenes, by the way, nobody necessarily, they, they know if they're asked a question or if some other step has to uh, involve them, but you're basically acting like you trust them, but you're verifying and making sure that they are worthy of the trust and that it's not somebody trying to dupe you. So, and I like that better than that sense of, of mistrust, just given that the nature of our business is so much of it happens online, you've got to be very, very open to, uh, uh, to, uh, to trusting the people you're doing business with. So, well, well, folks, when we come back, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about SSO and MFA, but first we want to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is JW Player. Now, everyone watches videos online. When it works well, you don't really even notice what video player you're using. Well, if you look closer, you'll notice that most likely 
It's JW Player. Now, having built tons of front ends, I can tell you that JW Player is one of the most flexible and feature-rich HTML5 video platforms out there today. It's easy to integrate and customize, and it meets your site's design and brand and Some of the features are pretty cool. If it's time to grow up from YouTube, JW Player has you covered. Now, the spectrum goes from your casual YouTuber all the way up to the large-scale publishers and broadcasters who want to maximize their video ad fill rates and CPMs. Now, if you visited the Twit website today, you probably noticed that when you watch a video on the site, it uses JW Player. Now, as Leo says, it is one of the most important features of the Twit website with quick access to any show. Right on the site, it's critical for Twit's business. JW Player gets out of the way and lets Twit shine. Now, Twit is not only the the awesome player, and it's used on some top websites and publishers like Washington Post, Business Insider, and Vice. All are able to customize that JW Player for their needs. Plus, JW Player was able to be integrated into their brands and seamlessly integrated into their website design as well. Now, if you're ready to take control of your video experience, here is what JW Player can bring to the table. They have buffer-free technology, makes it one of the fastest players on the net, a fully customizable player to match your brand, video CMS to manage your, your uploads and videos, plus they offer APIs to help you enhance the experience and integrate it into your site's functionality. Plus, if you're running ads, the player will help you max out your fill rates and CPMs. To me, if you're serious about offering content, JW Player is the way to go. Now visit jwplayer.com slash twit and use the code twit at checkout to get 50% off your business subscription. This is a limited time exclusive offer for twit.tv listeners, so be sure to check it out today. That's jwplayer.com slash twit and use code twit at checkout. And we thank JW Player for their support of this week and enterprise tech. Well, folks, we're talking with Bill Kaplan, CEO of Digital Envoy, about SSO and MFA. But, you know, I want to also bring my co-host back in. I think, Curtis, you had a follow-up question here uh, where, you, where you were talking about how to have zero trust and SSO integration. Well, yeah, I did have the question. But, you know, I really am interested in how well the single sign-on um, architecture works with some of the um, regulatory frameworks we've seen, you know, a lot, especially in some of the very uh, high value data scenarios, uh, whether it be healthcare or uh, financial services, you've got some very serious regulatory issues uh, looking at authentication of the users. Does single sign-on meet all of those? And if it does, do you have to do anything special with the single sign-on to make it meet the regulatory requirements? Yeah, another great question, a tough question. Uh, the, the regulatory pressure is uh, is intense across. I mean, it's been on the financial services side forever. I, I think on the healthcare side, and, and rightfully so, uh, it, it's got an, an even higher level of rigor where we have HIPAA and high tech and, uh, and tough enforcement of it. So if you're a, in healthcare, you, you have to do everything by the book and and, uh, and you do have to be careful what you do. It, it has led to a lot of uh, the uses of tokens in the healthcare environment, especially where it relates to medical professionals or, or healthcare employees accessing sensitive information. Um, in our approach to single sign-on and to login authentication and everything we do, we try to limit the personal information that's involved in the exchange. And to, to some extent, that's at the heart of a lot of the, the regulations. They want protection but they want to make sure that in um, in providing the proper level of protection, you're not putting information out that uh, uh, that is PII or, or sensitive in some other respects and uh, and needs to be encrypted, hashed, or or not used at all. And and we tend to take that approach with with our solutions to uh, to try to avoid the use of anything is, that is private or sensitive. So I, I hope that gets at your question. I happy to talk more if uh, if it didn't. So I think I think our Brian actually had a question about uh, integration in the current networks, right, Brian? Brian? Yeah, thanks, Lou. I, I have some experience in this space, and one of the things that I've I've seen is that uh, SSO solutions promise uh, a lot of ease for the end user, and even at at some point, ease for the the administrator by not having to manage passwords for multiple accounts. 
Uh, but the trick is actually the integration work. How easy is it to take Digital Envoy's uh, solution, the, the Resolve platform, and actually do turnkey integrations with your Salesforce, with your uh, Conquer and your other SaaS-based services, as well as on-prem applications, which you know customers certainly want a single sign-on to. So, you know, can you take me through some of the the common you know integration stories that that you know, and, and how you, how do you make that easy for the administrator to onboard uh, the the platform? Yeah, uh, and another great question, and um, and certainly from a sales and marketing standpoint, I want to make it sound as easy as possible. But the reality is, every environment is a little bit different, so uh, you can have some that just go like clockwork and there are no issues, and then uh, you can have some that don't. So the the fact that we are deployed in the cloud and that we can bring up an instance and begin set up with a, a customer virtually within 24 hours gives us the ability uh, not only to bring them up quickly, but to let them begin to test uh, if they're able to split their user uh, population and not everybody can do that, but we can set up a subset of the population so we can see how things are flowing, see if there are issues that, that are encountered uh, and basically take uh, corrective measures before it gets rolled out to a bigger population. So um, because we support SAML 2.0 applications, um, unless you have a, an application and, and there are some old ones out there that aren't SAML 2.0, you literally check a box and that's oversimplification, but pretty close to checking a box to say, uh, we want to uh, uh, use this with Concur, we want to use it with Salesforce, we want to use it with Gmail, all of those are uh, SAML 2.0 compliant and thus very easy to deploy. When it gets into things that are older, uh, legacy sort of uh, applications, they get to be more difficult, uh, but not impossible. And again, that's just something that we work through with, uh, with customers. Um, in the on-premise environment, it's just a little bit more complicated because more of it is out of our control than uh, in the cloud environment. Um, but it again, just takes a, a partnership with the customer to make sure that we know going in uh, the, the applications that need to be included in single sign-on, those that, that are particularly sensitive that maybe need uh, treatment and uh, priorities and hierarchy of, of access. But uh, it can be done and, and uh, it is honestly a bit longer process, but, uh, but not impossible to do. So in an on-prem environment like that, Bill, what would I be looking at in terms of, uh, you know, and it, as the integration point? Is that as simple as, you know, plugging into uh, the on, on-prem directory infrastructure? Uh, and or, or is it something more involved like a portal or a proxy uh, that the end user would have to visit? You know, what, what's that, that user experience like uh, once, once it's implemented or, and, and what's the experience like from the um, administrator point of view? Do you have to be using Active Directory or can it be something else? Um, you know, how much flexibility is there there? Yeah, um, so it's, uh, it's easy. It's a, a check of the box if it's Active Directory or LDAP. LDAP uh, I think Active Directory is probably the, the most common that we find. Uh, but there are still some people that do something uh, different. And uh, I can't say what we've encountered outside of that, but, but I do think Active Directory is the most common. Uh, basically, once we bring up the instance in Amazon, uh, we, uh, we have a synchronization agent. Uh, sorry, I just lost my lights here. Um, the, we have a synchronization agent that basically uh, coordinates the exchange of information between the local directory server uh, and the uh, the cloud instance. So uh, even that in an on-prem environment is a pretty straightforward, uh, easy process. So uh, again, just a little bit more, uh, a little trickier in the on-prem environment, but um, but probably just a bit more time than any real technical complexity. So now we actually have heard some about some services out there um, that are also doing. SSO and MFA. We don't we don't live in a bubble, so we know that there's uh, some competitors out there today, like Duo Security, who is that cloud-based MFA provider, uh, and they actually integrate with Active Directory Radius. And then we have SaaS Pass and Azure MFA. Now, what what differences? Uh, what like there's actually obviously a lot of differences between these services. What is kind of the advantage over your service? And then you know another question on top of that would be, how does an organization decide where to go? Yeah, again, uh, just like there are lots of threats out there to deal with and, and uh, 
uh, lots of things to be worried about. There are lots of vendors out there that uh, that offer services, uh, whether it's single sign-on or other types of security. Uh, and there's a lot of noise in that. So um, we believe the best way to figure out the best solution for you is to try it. And uh, in single sign-on and everything else, we encourage a free proof of concept. We're willing to deploy the solution, uh, give you a chance in whatever size test environment you want to uh, uh, to give it a run and, and see if it performs the way uh, our salespeople say it does, and we think it does, but uh, but we believe, again, the trust and verify uh, customers are entitled to that. So um, that, that's a big part of it. I, I think with the companies you mentioned, and, and I would say, I wouldn't badmouth any company out there. There are some really big ones out there. Um, one of the important things we think is the control of the multi-factor authentication solution. Um, and most vendors don't have their own. They do uh, uh, use third parties for it, uh, at least to the extent of going beyond a very basic or, or primary level of multi-factor authentication. So we, we feel like that gives us and gives our customers absolute control and some significant cost benefits. Um, and at the end of the day, we're all enthusiastic about getting new customers. We really feel like part of our differentiation is we're just as enthused as keep in keeping our customers and keeping them happy. And and those that select us, I think, uh, can tell stories of, of ha having had difficulty in reaching other vendors. And uh, some where we've taken away from competitors have told the stories of not being able to get to somebody to uh, to resolve a problem, perhaps. So, um, so yeah, I, I think, again, trust and verify. We're willing to provide free tests of our solution to prove its value um, and are happy to go up against uh, any incumbent or any company. And then, Put our best foot forward. And Brian, you so, had a question about integration, right? So, Bill, you mentioned SAML 2.0 a number of times, and I agree that's a that's a great open standard to to pin around because there's a lot of support for it. An, another protocol, uh, single sign-on and federation protocol that I hear a lot about when I go and talk to F5's customers is OAuth. Is there any plans in in Digital Resolve to support OAuth as well, or are you really going to stay focused on SAML 2.0 primarily? Yeah, we, we uh, elected to go with SAML 2.0 because it has been the standard and it covers a lot. OAuth uh, seems like a great initiative. A lot of big uh, companies have signed on to that. So we absolutely will pursue that path. Um, our single sign-on solution is relatively new. It it grew out of as an expansion of our, our login authentication services that we've been providing for almost 15 years now. So um, our roadmap has a lot of things we want to continue to uh, build towards, and OAuth will certainly fit into that. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, we've uh, run out of time. Bill Kaplan, CEO of Digital Envoy, thanks again for being on this weekend at Bright Tech. If someone wanted to get started with Digital Resolve or any of your other services, where can they go? Where can they get it started? Uh, certainly at digitalresolve.com. Great show. <laughs> I appreciate being a part of it. Fantastic. Well, we thank you for being on this week at Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, unfortunately, we've run out of time. You've done it again. You've listened to another hour of the best staying enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10, SAML Tokens. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially our co-hosts with whom I wouldn't want to do this show, starting with Mr. Brian McHenry. Brian, thank you so much for being here again. Brian, where can they go and find you and all of your work? Hey, thanks, Lou. You can find me, as always, on BA McHenry on, on Twitter, as well as devcentral.f5.com, where F5 users gather from around the world, share ideas, share uh, innovations about how to fix common problems and even integrate into single sign-on frameworks like Digital Resolve. Fantastic. And of course, we have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, where can they find you and all of your work and all of your adventures? Well, as always, they can find my writing at Dark Reading. That's darkreading.com. I will almost always uh, tweet pointers to those articles on my Twitter account at KG4GWA. Uh, got some interesting stuff coming up. I continue to work on artificial intelligence in security, uh, doing some IoT stuff, and actually have a bunch of things coming up uh, regarding some of the new threats that are out there. If you have any ideas, feel free to uh, send me a direct message on Twitter. Shoot me an email. Love to hear from members of the Twyatt Riot. Well, guys, thanks so much for being here. We look forward to you guys coming back on again. 
Well, we also want to thank you. You are our loyal listeners, our loyal followers. You keep coming each and every week to listen and to watch this week at Enterprise Tech. And we want to make it easy for you to do so. So head out right now to twit.tv slash twiat, where there you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, all of our previous episodes, as well as the, next to those videos there, you actually see those download and subscribe links. Basically, they will support you on whether no matter what you want, the audio version or the video version or the H2 video version and allow you to subscribe on any one of your devices. As well as we also have all the show notes and information about our guests and our co-hosts there as well. And it's pretty much the best way you can stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. Now, after you subscribe, you might want to share that show with your friends and coworkers and family because we love doing this show. And without your support, we can't keep doing it. So please share it with your friends and family. Now, after you subscribe, also remember we do the show live each and every week at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time at live.twit.tv. If you want to come see how the show is run and how it's set up, come on over and check it out live. And if you're going to jump in live, you might as well jump into the chat room live now. Now, even though IRC is 30 years old this year, it allows us to kind of connect to our audience and even before and after the show and during the show as well. So come jump in at irc.twit.tv. We love the chat room and there are always great discussions in there as well. Now, don't forget to follow me on twitter.com slash LouMM. You get to see what I do during my week at my day job at Microsoft, where you can also check out dev.office.com, where, you, where I post all the latest and greatest ways to customize Office and your experience to make it more productive. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially Leo and Lisa, who continue to support us each and every week to do this, this week in enterprise tech. I also want to thank our tireless producer, Mr. Brian Chi, for setting up all the guests in the shows. So we appreciate all of his time and all of his effort, as well as we have to thank all of the engineers at Twit as well. And before we sign out, we have to thank our great TD, Kevin, today. And Kevin, of course, we want to go with tradition and ask, what, what's, what was the ma- major topic of the show today? Uh, MFA. Um, <laughs> it was multi... Uh, Masters of Fine Arts. Oh, so close. But unfortunately, the answer we were looking for was the demise of Kerberos. But thank you so much for trying. And maybe next time you'll get it right. And well, folks, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, if you just want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twiling.